Well, thank you so much, Amy, for that wonderful welcome and for everyone at the School of Creative Arts at the University of the Fraser Valley for inviting us to discuss her exhibition, Shishich Dered, or A Crack in the Mirror, um, which is up at the Reach Gallery Museum um, in Abbotsford, BC until um, I think early May. Uh, so the show um, is a survey of recent works by artists um, Simran Breed the Nund and Connor Vanderbeek. Um, we're here today to give us um, a really amazing artist talk. Um, and in this show, what they're doing is contemplating the kind of moments of fracture um, that have shaped their, you know, really complex journeys, the density of Punjabi and Sikh diasporic um, life, um, politics, institutions, kind of everything. Um, and uh, so uh, because of time's sake, I want to just kind of really delve in. Um, so what we're going to start off with is an um, this joint artist talk uh, by Simran Breed, who's going to speak first, um, and then Connor, uh, and then they're going to come together to share some joint comments um, at the end. Um, after that, uh, we'll have a short discussion um, where I'll be asking some questions um, and thinking about how the exhibition has been received um, by Sikh communities and the general public. Um, and then we'll open up the um, uh, we'll open up for general questions from everyone. Um, and I wanted to uh, just also personally thank Simran Preet and Connor for inviting you on to be a part of this um, project. And um, it's been fun uh, being a guest curator um, and I'm sure that role will continue to unfurl. Um, and also a big thank you to Adrian and everyone at The Reach um, for making this exhibition possible in the first place. They've put in so much effort, um, you know, conceptually and logistically and technically. Um, and thank you so much. Um, and now to introduce um, Simran Preet and Connor, um, I'll be reading out their bios for you. So Simran Preet um, Anand is an artist, curator, and cultural worker creating and working on the unceded territories of the Kwantalan, Katsi, and Semiamu peoples, um, also in Surrey. Um, she holds a BFA honors in visual arts, along with a ma second major in psychology from the University of British Columbia. Her art practice interrogates the so-called neutral audience in multicultural society. So to accomplish this, she, she uses materials, particularly textiles, language, performative gestures, and photographs that resonate beyond the typical art gallery context. Anand's works are meant for multiple audiences with different frames of cultural and or artistic reference. Her practice is informed by familial and community histories, often engaging materials and concepts drawn from the histories of Punjab and the Punjabi diaspora, and the ways in which they have been disrupted by colonialism and forced migration. The reclamation of cultural practice in her work interrogates colonial theft, cultural propaganda, and forces of global capitalism. Simran Preet is committed to a socially engaged practice, having worked on community engagement and education projects with the Morris and Helen Belkin Art Gallery, the Evergreen Cultural Center, Documenta 14, the Hatch Art Gallery, and the Surrey Art Gallery. Um, so welcome, yay. Very impressive and cool bio. Um, and Connor. Uh, Connor Singh Vanderbeek is a multi-ethnic Punjabi American Sikh ethnomusicologist and media artist based somewhere between California and Arbor, Vancouver, and Toronto. They write music and words, study contemporary Punjabi art, culture, and diaspora, and do visuals and video. They also play piano, harmonium, and Javanese gamelan, um, so stuffed animals and study South Asian textiles and moonlight as a collaborative artist. Their art explores narratives of trauma, belonging, Sikh identity, and mundanity through styles ranging from jazz and classical to performance art and noise. Their research is on Canadian diversity, policy, and the arts, and how it misunderstands and reduces racialized identities. They also focus on cultural memory and identity politics in the Sikh diaspora. They are a PhD candidate in ethnomusicology at the University of Michigan and hold a MA in South Asian Studies from Michigan. Um, and a dual degree BA, M, uh, BA, BM in South Asian Studies, Music Composition and Musicology from Northwestern University, which is a very amazing eclectic um, set of skills and stuff. So um, very excited. I'll turn it over to both of you um, and then we'll chat more after that. Thanks, Saj. Uh, so in the interest of time, I'm just gonna jump into our presentation. So hello everyone, my name is Simran Preetanand, my pronouns are she, her. Uh, if you want to note down my email or my website, you can find more information about me there. Uh, the first work that I want to talk about, and I'll talk um, pretty much exclusively about works that are in the exhibition Shishich Um, 
so this is the first work that I want to talk about, which is the Star Banenle Blueprint. And before I start talking about my work, I just want to give a sort of um, introduction to myself that's like not the very professional bio that everyone uh, ends up giving at these talks. So uh, I grew up uh, on Kwantlen, Kitsi, and Semiyamo territory, which is also known as Surrey. Um, and to a lot of people here, uh, they'll also know that it's a pretty dense uh, Punjabi slash South Asian uh, diaspora. And my interest in art was cultivated at a very young age by my mom um, and also kind of collaboratively with my sisters. Uh, and I, when I went to university at first, um, I started with studying psychology and eventually just felt like I wouldn't have the emotional capacity to go into counseling, which was what I had thought of doing. And then I took a number of courses between, uh, calculus and economics and fine art. And, um, I really enjoyed the classes in fine art at UBC because they challenged what my, conception or idea of art was. And that's kind of where the title of the show, She Shaped the Day, comes from. Um, Saj wrote a really beautiful essay that I think someone can link to in the chat. Um, but uh, the title, She Shaped the Day, comes from a Punjabi folk song um, sung by Srinder Gore. And kind of the crack in the mirror represents sort of like a shift in perspective or change in viewpoints. And so I think a lot of where my artwork uh, is coming from is sort of like coming from this critical lens, this um, really uh, embodied experience with materials and working with others in my own cultural community in order to think through broader questions around culture and diaspora and colonialism. Uh, so this work, without further ado, um, the Star Banan Lay Blueprint is a series of what I'm sort of conceptualizing as photographs. Um, and you might look at this and be like, this isn't a photograph, these are dyed fabrics. Uh, but the process behind this work was learning different styles of tying the stars and the stars are the sick turban or a word for the sick turban. Um, and then I coded the, the stars in cyanotype chemicals and cyanotype is sort of an older photographic process um, that was used a lot in blueprinting technology, technology early blueprint printing technology. And um, it's photosensitive. So when it gets exposed to light, it turns blue. So in terms of what you're seeing in this image, the inside parts of the distar end up being white and all of the parts that you can see when a distar is tied end up being blue. So you can see that actually not a lot of the distar is visible when you've tied it. And if you haven't seen the work uh, in person, these are actually quite large fabrics, uh, which I, I've heard from very many people is not necessarily legible when you first see the work. Um, so the longest, the stars are about seven meters and the shortest ones are about two and a half meters. And uh, yeah, I guess what I was thinking of when making this work was uh, the sort of colonial terminology that goes alongside photography, shooting, capturing, taking a photograph and wanting to create a lensless image that was um, still in dialogue with that history, but sort of confronting it in this way of like what it means to create a photograph that is non-representational and where the object that you're quote unquote capturing is part of the photograph itself. Um, this next work is called Hamari Swadki Asliyat, or Insatiable Desires of a Bourgeoisie. You might also notice throughout the talk that a lot of the work is titled in Punjabi in English, um, or in this case, Hindi in English. Uh, and the titles are also a part of how I think through the artwork. Um, sometimes the title is uh, transliterated into English. Sometimes it's translated into English. Sometimes it has nothing to do, like they have nothing to do with each other. Um, and that's all intentional. And I can speak to that more if people have questions at the end. Um, but Hamari Swad uh thinks about the uh, 
materials and goods that were exported during the colonial era, uh, particularly spices and carpets, and uh, complicates their relationship in some ways. The images that are on these rugs are woven in, um, and they're pixelated images of MDH Masala spice boxes, and MDH has a particular history of also um, being dislocated during partition and um, it's sort of history of, you know, not being a colonial spice producer, but then taking on things like butter chicken and curry powder. And so those things are complicated through this like messy, fuzzy image. This image uh, is titled Betuk, the Blue Room. This image is actually taken uh, in Connor's Nanaji and Naniji's home which is near Yuba City in California. And I was honestly just sitting on their couch one day and I started looking at these images and there was this sense of these images are familiar, they're nostalgic, they're a part of home. But yeah, I was hundreds of kilometers from what I call home. And I've noticed these images in other South Asian diasporas. So whether you go to South Hall or if you go to Nairobi or even if you go to Delhi, these are images that you see quite often. Um, and there was kind of this question of like, well, why do we see these images so often? What is the political sort of history behind these images? But then also how do they characterize a space? Um, and this is going to be a part of sort of an ongoing uh, body of work where I'm hoping to take photographs within people's homes and these environments around the images in order to kind of understand um, the context around them and framing them. This work is from a performance art piece uh, called Sumundar de Ojikanare at the same shore of the ocean. And uh, this is just a document, but the performance piece uh, was done on the anniversary of the docking of the Kamagana Maru, where I washed a turban uh, 376 times at the shore of the ocean in Vancouver. And I was really thinking of how um, the ocean holds the sort of like memory or history of the Kamagana Maru, but also the water as this body that is unforgiving or that is like, was not, um, able for people on the Kamagana Maru to like really contend with um, and how when you're washing something in an ocean, the waves crash against you versus when you're washing something in a river like in Punjab, the waves or the flow of the water goes past you and sort of thinking about this like locatedness and the water and the way that it moves. Um, and now I'll move it on to Connor. Oh, there I am. Uh, thank you, Simran Preet. Thank you, Sajdeep, for the introduction. Uh, Amy and The Reach and UFE and Adrian uh, for all of that. Um, my name is Connor Singh Vanderbeek. Uh, my pronouns are he slash them. Uh, if you want to take a moment to note down my website or email or uh, I guess social media tag, here it is. It's me. Hello, everybody. Um, I want to start before anything by, we mentioned just now the photo from my Nanaji and Naniji's uh, bedroom, or sorry, living room, this the sitting room. And I wanted to take a moment to just show a picture in my, my small little frame of my Nanaji and Naniji, uh, because today would have been my Nanaji's 91st birthday. Uh, he passed away in October of 2021, no, 2020, where has time gone in the pandemic? Uh, in October of 2020, he was in an accident on his farm. Uh, he was a farmer and poet and uh, one of the smartest man, men I have ever met in my life and has been like a great inspiration and sort of like guiding star for me to follow in my own the artistic and scholarly pursuit. So I just want to start with that. Uh, if we could go to the next slide. So uh, this is a very concise uh, summary of me 
Um, you see on the top left, a picture of me with my parents. Um, my dad is American, Mambi Sardi Punjabi. Uh, so my mom is Punjabi. Uh, she, her father came from India in 1963 to settle in California and the rest of the family followed in 1968. Um, and much of my life has been spent living between these two cultures of, I, I wouldn't say white America, but certainly like, uh, definitely like sports America. Um, those of you who know me, know me that I'm very, know that I'm very mild mannered until I'm talking about sports and then a certain amount of like aggression and masculinity comes out. <clears throat> uh, the next image on the top right is of, uh, previous slide please. Uh, of me with my friend Zach Iskoff, who's a bass player. Uh, he and I collaborate a lot, write a lot of music together. So this is me sort of as a jazz collaborative pianist. The third image on the bottom left is of a piece of video art slash composition uh, performed with my friend AJ Covey, who's a percussionist. Um, this is a piece scored for uh, vibraphone and electronics with gong and gamelan kampool. It's quite an eclectic mix of instruments. And then the bottom image, bottom of right, is of the University of Michigan Javanese gamelan, which I've been a member of for three years, and it's quite an important part of my sort of musical identity or musical, you know, participation moving forward. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so, my sort of first language is piano. I work as a composer and lately I work in sort of explorations of where Western art music language intersects with uh, Indian music, uh, particularly rag, ideas of scale, ways of organizing pitches. So this is an excerpt from my fugue, which I wrote in 2012, the sort of climax of it. Uh, if we could share the sound from the device on the clip. Um, Okay, next slide, please. Um, I so I also work um, a lot with setting text. This is a piece that my friend David and I did called Overnight, and I really like to take text and think through uh, certain visceral cues or sensory emotional cues in the language and amplify that through music. So this is, uh, let's play about 45 seconds of this maybe. Very nice. Next door is being haunted by cat eyes. I'm famous for not giving examples but I had wanted to take up a routine exercise that would involve moving limbs entire instead of in increments or as perceived only through a time lapse. In the few movements of sleeves and shoelaces, spreadsheets, so on. The vitals are holed up in a torso of after effects and there they are. There are stories of success for us to still diligently tabulate. We exit as we have a plague that you'll agree speaks like all it answers. Uh, next slide, please. 
stick overnight. Uh, yeah, all of these pieces are on my website or on my Vimeo, so I don't want to spend too much time uh, showing them. Uh, so this piece is a piece I composed uh, after a, after my first trip to India. I did a month long research project in uh, Punjab on sort of the orthodox politics of Sikh sacred music, uh, which is a very contentious topic, honestly. Uh, and I tried to do it without disrespecting anybody whatsoever because uh, it's not my place to judge the authenticity of any one practice that I'm not participating in. Uh, but this piece was inspired by that trip. Uh, this piece is called Jord, and it was on the occasion of a residency by members of the International Contemporary Ensemble at Northwestern in 2015. Uh, so the clip you're about to hear is an audio transcription of a call to prayer I heard uh, in Jalandhar, in, in a small village outside of Jalandhar in Punjab. Um, and it starts with sort of like a timbral transcription and then turns into a Western style canon. So one voice entering slightly staggered from the other to again put these, you know, Indian sound materials, South Asian sound materials in conversation with my Western training. So if we could play 40 seconds or so of this. That should be, that's, that's enough of a flavor if we could uh, go to the next slide. Um, I also want to mention my research. Uh, on the left is an article in the journal Sick Formations, which is a leading Sikh studies journal um, edited by Professor Arvind Palmander. Uh, so I, I consider a lot what it means to be mixed uh, Punjabi Sikh American in my research. On the right side is some of my writing on diversity policy in Vancouver and Vancouver models of public funding. Uh, this is in Rung Magazine, rung.org. Uh, and it's a really beautiful uh, open source, not behind a paywall uh, journal that's run out of Vancouver. Uh, next slide, please. And I want to end with uh, a piece that Simran Preet and I developed together called Simple Recipes for Kitchen Appliances and Keyboard. Uh, it was sort of what we did to fill time in the pandemic, but I'll let you see it and decide what it is.
That's a sampling of my work. I think this work comes out of, uh, uh, you know, it's the pandemic. Who do we play with? And with that, I welcome Simmerpreet back onto the, uh, the Zoom screen. Hi, Simmerpreet. Hi. Hi, Connor. Um, so now we're both going to talk about the work that we have in collaboration or some works within a large body of work that's a part of Shisha Chitterd at the Rich Gallery Museum. Uh, so the body of work that we've produced together is called Bande Jashim Didin Fanai. So Bande Jashim Didin Fanai actually comes from the Guru Granth Sahib, which is the sacred scripture of the six, um, and loosely translates to Bande, which means people, uh, jashem, which is like your eyes or the way you see, uh, Didin Fanai, like will cease to exist at some point, um, which I think was like a, an appropriate title for the work that we're making and sort of also um, foreshadows the ways in which we've titled the rest of the work in uh, this body of work. And Basically, the starting for this project came from understanding the ecosystem around the Sikh Ramallah Saib. And the Ramallah Saib is uh, a textile that's used within the Sikh faith to sort of clothe or cover the Guru Granth Saib. And what happens is that whenever there's an auspicious occasion, so like a wedding or a birth, people will give the Rumallah Saib as an offering. And um, you can vaguely see the Rumallah Saib on, in the video work on the right-hand side um, being used in various different ways. You'll see it again come up um, throughout the slideshow and also feel free to ask questions if you have any throughout. Um, so I'll move on to the first work. So this is the first work, and the title is Uch Nich Bagar Sukrit Sanlagan Sab Sukh Chatra Mitra Satra Nagachu Jane Sarabji Samata. So the titles for all of the works come from the Guru Granth Sahib as a way to not take ownership over these materials that are part of like that have a lived life within the sick, um, within a sick space, but also as a way to think of the sick ethos being in conversation with the work um, and having an active dialogue with the work. So the sort of thought process behind this work in particular came from this idea of like the Jindoa side, which is the canopy that you see hanging above the installation, but also the fabric that is on this platform is another canopy that has been inverted. And the question sort of is, you know, if we need the canopy to demarcate a sacred space, does the canopy need a canopy? And sort of in creating this install, it became more about questions of how uh, sacred space is constructed, what are the elements of a sacred space, um, what are the ways in which we touch these materials, think of these materials, act or behave around these materials. And the plastic flower petals and the marigold garlands uh, have become a really big part of the work broadly because of the way in which they really stand in as a metaphor for these uh, synthetic materials that are made largely of plastic that used to at some point be made out of more natural fibers and materials. So they really stand in in that way and are also used across so many different spiritual and religious traditions. Connor, do you want to talk about this work? 
Yeah, so this group is, sorry, this group, this piece is called Malke Mane Rupki Soba Itabiti Janam Gavaya. And we looked, we, we considered for a while, uh, you know, the ways in which the Mande Saab are handled throughout their lives, but also pass on to the next life. Uh, and typically that's through a process called Agen Thet Seva, which is a ritual cremation of sick materials, whether it's the Guru Granth Sahib itself, or, uh, you know, pictures of the Guru Granth Sahib or Ramalde Sahib themselves. And this work is made up of textiles that could have been Ramalde Sahib. You can see Ramalde Sahib that are made out of these materials, uh, but these themselves are not. They don't have the border sewn onto them and they don't have, they, they have not been ritually activated as Ramal de Saab through proximity to the Guru or offering to a, a place of Sikh worship. And so we considered, you know, what happens when these touch the ground, um, they have become polluted and they have to be burned. But in the process of being burned, we also reveal the material conditions, which is that these are largely synthetic fabrics. They burn in ways that are very plastic um, and they off gas fumes when they are burned. So there is sort of a duality to this work as we've seen it installed. It's sort of the wall that people want to take photos against because it is quite striking and it is visually very beautiful. But then if you look down at the ground, you see actually these, these are pieces of burned and charred plastic to sort of look at what materials these are being made out of. And of course, synthetic materials are cheaper. They last a long time. Uh, they're easy to produce. They're easy to distribute. So it's not our place to say, oh, it's wrong that these are made of plastic, but it is our place. It's, what we're trying to do is question, um, you know, why is it that things that were months once made of natural material have turned into synthetic things uh, related to fast fashion, related to globalization, uh, and, and things of that sort. So, Mimpreet, if you have anything to add. No, that was great. Uh, so this next work is a collaboration between Connor and I, and it is a video work, but I wanted to show you this install sh shot first, um, because I think the installation in the exhibition is worth noting, uh, particularly because it's projected downwards. So when you walk into the space, uh, there is no one way from which to view this work. Um, and I'll just play a little bit of it first, and then we can talk about it. Can people hear me if I talk, if I keep talking over this? Could someone maybe send a thumbs up in the chat? <laughs> okay. Um, so I, this work kind of came from us putting together this exhibition or starting to sort of think through uh, the works uh, that we wanted to make. And for about a year, we just sat with these Ruma Lassab textiles in our studio or in our space and just unfolded them, refolded them. And there's a whole process behind handling these materials, you know, washing your hands beforehand, covering your head, all of these things that are just a part of our embodied experience of handling these materials. And so um, this sort of performance of like, uh, spiritual practice or how we are supposed to handle these materials uh, became really important to how we were thinking about the work and how we wanted to show the work. And 
there are a lot more things that are embedded within uh, this work in terms of like thinking about the Kapra Mandi, fabric stores, how people lay out uh, fabrics, the sort of unstitched nature of a lot of Indian South Asian fabrics. Um, but I'm also realizing the time and I want to leave time for questions at the end. Um, and maybe this is the last work we'll, or second last work we'll talk about, um, which is a really uh, short, funny work that Connor and I produced together, uh, which came from this sort of like, I guess language pun of Punjabi. So a lot of the alphabets in Punjabi are uh, like phonetic repetitions of themselves. So like the letter for R is Rara. Um, and so the letter for H is Haha. -ha. So this is the letter for H and it repeats. So it's ha 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 ha, um, which becomes a joke, but also where we're thinking of uh, how uh, kind of help me out <laughs> how how yeah. like the the piece is titled set of so and then brackets laughing in foreign language so it says only 90s kids will remember this and it's a reflection on playing around with window screen savers but also in a language that we didn't necessarily have access to on operating systems and on technology back then so it's commenting on nostalgia, but also misunderstanding, um, and also the tendency of like, say Netflix, they have subtitles, somebody speaks in a foreign language, and it just says in brackets, speaking in foreign language. There's no meaning to what they're saying, it's just foreign speak. Uh, so we're taking that as a joke and subverting it. And with that, I think we'll invite the back. Um, and I already see one question in the chat, but maybe if you wanted to. Um... Yeah, um, so I'm going to take up that question um, and just offer some uh, some brief commentary um, and then we can just open it up to, uh, to some other audience questions. So one of, you know, the really, you know, the big challenges that I think artists of color face is they're often kind of tasked with having to create artwork that's representative, you know, and so it's like, you're a Sikh or Punjabi artist, tell us about your community, you know, create art about what it means to go to a gurdwara, what's it like inside there, and so you're kind of tasked with this, this really difficult job of showing this is what it's like in this world and what's really great about you know the works that Simran Breed and Connor have made both individually and collaboratively is that they kind of move from being representative to being um, mediative and transformative these you know both of these artists are really deeply involved in their communities and they're making artistic works and devising artistic practices that can kind of uh, respond to, disturb, partake, um, and transform the worlds that they're a part of. Um, and, you know, a, a part of that is um, encountering a public. Um, and so when you have a community engaged practice, um, you ended up having to be quite responsive um, to people. Um, and in this case, to, you know, the, you know, the kind of vast diversity of Punjabi and Sikh people, um, you know, who have at times, I think, maybe express personal, religious, or political concerns um, about your work as it's developed over the years, um, including some of the pieces that are that are shown in this work. And, you know, when you get um, feedback and commentary and criticism, you know, in some cases, you know, I think, you know, you do have to kind of stand your ground and defend some of your artistic and curatorial decisions. Um, and in others, um, you have the opportunity to adjust certain works. And I think both of you have kind of had your journeys with that. Um, you know, and the final works that we've seen in the exhibition are really a result of that process and practice, the artistic practice that you've honed in. Um, and I first want to say, I think you bring a lot of kind of both humility and courage to that process, um, which is really amazing. Um, and so um, one of those concerns um, uh, that's been brought up that um, I think Adrian's reference in, in the chat um, is this critique that the gallery is kind of not the appropriate place to engage Sikhi um, and the practices of Sikh religious institutions, um, which I think you take up, you know, most substantially in, um, in your Bande Jashan work, um, but also in some of the other pieces as well. Um, and the kind of first part of that claim is premised on the belief that it's only Gardwaras, presumably those aligned with the SGPC, um, those are the kind of the only proper and right places where we should be interpreting, engaging, and sharing Sikh thought. Um, and I think there's like 
you know, a lot of problems that can arise from this very constricting um, vision for what Sikhism should be. Um, and we can, you know, maybe think about some of the difficulties that are faced by voices that are marginalized within those spaces, particularly along the lines of gender, caste, race, sexuality, sect, ability, et cetera. We can kind of point even, you know, to the historical development of various different sects of Sikhism. You know, you can think of non thadi Sikhs, you know, my family's part non thadi um, And so we have very, you know, different interpretations of things. Um, you can think about the Ravi Dasi community. Um, and what they've done is they've all devised and created their own spaces in order to engage Sikhi. Um, you know, and also kind of importantly here, we could also think about art spaces, both within Punjab and its diasporas that are, have also been historically important sites for engaging and pushing the interpretive bounds and practices of Sikhi. Um, Surinder Kaur, um, you know, whose song uh, kind of makes up the title of this text, um, you know, herself performed Gurbani um, in recording studios, right? Um, and kind of pushed the bounds of who was allowed to sing and, and practice Shabd and stuff. And so um, we're really trying to think about what the what art spaces and artistic institutions have to offer to the expansion and proliferation of the infinite possibilities that are possible when you start to engage Gurbani, um, rather than kind of delimiting and kind of constricting some of those. And you know, one of my favorite works that you take that up in is the Bande Jashim uh, set of works, you know, where we're presented with Gurbani, all of these old verses from the you know, 15th and 16th century in Punjab and asked to kind of take all of the lessons from there um, and then bring that to bear on kind of some of the contemporary um, practices um, that happen within Sikh institutions, particularly around the use of um, synthetic class and laden textiles that take on this quality of sacredness. Um, you know, and, and so um, that's, you know, a bit of a response, but I wanted to kind of just open up a question to both of the artists around um, just talking about what it's been like working with communities um, and how that's shaped, you know, some of your work and your approach. And you can feel free to kind of respond to um, uh, this question that uh, Adrian's raised as well. And then um, uh, maybe I can uh, take some other questions from the audience. I think Ruby has one. Yeah. Um... Yeah, I mean, I think something really important to note is that this work wasn't made in a silo. So there were a lot of people from the Punjabi Sikh community that we consulted and talked to about the work. And actually that did result in some like literal changes to the artwork. Um, and we didn't do some things and we changed some things because of that. And um, I think that was really important to the process, um, but I can see, I mean, I'm obviously not oblivious to the fact that this is like a very controversial topic, making work that is, you know, contradicting some of the ways in which people within like the organized practice of Sikhi operate is a thing where you're like playing with fire no pun intended. Um, and so like, I think one thing is that you have to start to create your own sanghats, like you have to create your own communities. Um, and like, there are so many ways in which like, I'm a woman, I am like, not the right cast. And like, you're gay. And like, Connor's genderqueer, like all of these things, like, are things that make us outside of the sick institution. And I think like it kind of necessitates our building of other sanghats outside of the Gurdwara. Yeah, and I would, I would just add to that. Uh, for me, I approach a lot of these topics as a researcher, uh, as somebody who has, because of my academic institutional affiliation, somebody who has access to a lot of resources. Um, and because I have access to those resources, I'm really interested in uh, taking sort of the, the base of knowledge I have access to through, for example, University of Michigan and uh, not using that as like, hey, I'm smarter than you, hit you over the head with the book, but as a way of, you know, always trying to humble myself and say, there is more knowledge out there that I haven't considered. 
and I am bringing in what I have access to as somebody who is mixed and didn't grow up much around Sikhi. I only really sort of identified as Punjabi Sikh in my 20s, so it's a fairly new thing to me. Um, and always wanting to check with others, uh, is what I'm doing okay? Is what I'm doing offending others? Is it contentious? And if it is, first I ask why, um, and sort of judge, okay, if the contentiousness is something that's offensive to people or is, you know, uh, harming their ideas of Sikhi or sort of uh, is, is harmful to their belief system in certain ways, I, I, I guess disrespectful is if, if what I'm presenting is disrespectful, then um, I have to consider my own ego and in, in sort of the construction of things and dial it back and say, okay, I can reformulate what I'm trying to argue as a scholar um, and revisit the materials and how best the materials can articulate that, um, which I guess is not as straightforward an answer as what Simmerbrey did. Um, ultimately, we did a lot of community consultation and that's what, what went into the, the work. Um, so I have a, looks like a bit of a follow-up question, which we'll take from Gurpreet Singh in the audience. Um, and then uh, maybe I'll just one final question from Rupi around collaboration. Um, and then maybe we can wrap it up. So Gurpreet Singh asks, so are artists responsible to the audience community that they create for or to the identity politics they embody or neither or both? Does this mean those artworks are intentionally divisive or are there avenues, interpretations for unifying broader Sangat? You know, I think you know, what's at stake in this question is the fact that you know, you know, we're both kind of working in collectives and working as individuals in the world, right? And we have so many different commitments in our lives, so many different obligations to different people, to different communities, um, and that there's a lot of complexity, you know? And there's no kind of easy avenue to take down that, right? And the kind of even the work of kind of building and unifying a broader Sangat is difficult. Yeah, you know? I mean, I feel like we have done the work in order to reach a broader Sangat. Some people are more ready for the conversation than others. And like the thing is, six are very diverse, even within that bubble of like people who are sick. And people will have very conservative ideas and people will have very liberal ideas. And it really depends on like, you could be an Amrit Thadi like Sikh who goes to the Gurdwara every day and still be a very liberal Sikh. You could be a Sikh who like doesn't tie a turban, doesn't go to the Gurdwara and still have very conservative ideas. So like there is this idea of a broader Sangat. I don't think in reality that broader Sangat has ever been unified. And you can see this in a lot of the conflicts that happen in the Sikh community more broadly. Um, we, I can, I can speak to how we've thought and maybe like this partially answers Rupi's question, but we'll more like in depth get to Rupi's question as well, that like in collaborating with each other, we had a lot of these conversations around like, who is this work for? Why are we making this work? Uh, what purpose does it serve? And ultimately, I mean, I think it is speaking to a broader Sangat in terms of like, hey, this is a practice that is not doing what we intended for it to do and asking those questions. I don't in any way mean to be like, this is what people should do. And so that's why I'm not saying like it in that way. Um, but I definitely think that like our identities as people who are Punjabi and Sikh are important in the sense that like, we grew up with an embodied knowledge of this culture and that like that knowledge goes into the work that we're making. Yeah, I think we do think of ourselves as being very responsible to represent Sikhi and represent Sikhs in ways that are not disrespectful. This was in the handling of textiles and the installation of textiles uh, no sacred objects touched the ground. 
There are very many works where there are white sheets underneath those pieces so that there is extra care that they don't touch the ground. Um, I don't know whether to say what if these um, if these works are meant to be divisive or unifying, I think they're meant to be thought provoking um, and people can take what they want from them. Um, and, and hopefully it leads to these sorts of broader conversations in the Sangeet. Um, but I, I think for both of us fully knowing that there are plural audiences to this work, both a Punjabi Sikh audience and then sort of a a general mainstream audience. Uh, we're responsible to the Punjabi Sikh audience. I don't think it's necessarily the case that we want to uh, represent Sikhi to an outside audience. Like we are, we are not the authentic Sikhs you yeah. look for. But also, and that's a, that's a bigger question around representation yeah. and what that means in contemporary art. But. Um, so yeah, I okay. I want to go back to Rupi's question so we don't pass by it. Yes, yeah, so we um, don't visit. Uh, but I mean, I think collaboration is like a really big part of my artistic practice at this point. Um, it was purposeful for the show to not be a solo show. I just don't really like the language around solo exhibitions and also that it's like the way that we talk about art practices. Um, and so in that way, I'm like really happy that I get to share space with another person. Um, and maybe that'll like come back to bite me in the back or something. But like, I just like the idea that the world is a lot more interconnected than like people working solo. Um, and like Connor and I just have the opportunity to have so many beautiful conversations and like through lines in our work. Um, one really important part of the exhibition that I haven't noted yet is how um, Sajdeep wrote all of the English text, um, but there are Punjabi texts with each artwork that I have written myself, which are iterations rather than translations of the text. Um, and then that those texts were also uh, read by me. And a lot of those audio recordings you can find on my website. Uh, I haven't updated it with the Punjabi texts themselves at this moment, but that's also important because like Connor and I bring this importance of like Punjabi language and what types of access that brings, like talking about Sangat and community, like who then has access to the work. And so like having that language also includes like a Punjabi reading audience, which is generally a, an older audience, people who don't have access to the English language, but also having the audio recordings in Punjabi uh, brings in a younger Punjabi audience and allows them to understand it from the Punjabi Sikh perspective with the, like knowing that that would be the context someone has in mind if they're listening to the Punjabi recording. Yeah, and I, I think in terms of collaboration, um, you know, I grew up as a pianist and a composer very much about my own ego and about my ability to do things by myself. Um, and I think I really grew tired of that at some point. And I really enjoy collaboration. I really enjoy cross-medium collaboration, me predominantly coming as a, as a musician and, and media artist and Simran Freak more as visual installation, sculptural, textile, you know, anything visual, not reducing her to any single medium. Um, and that I think that gives us both an opportunity to delve more into unfamiliar mediums. Um, I never thought I would be presenting visual artworks. Um, I can draw stick figures, that's about it. Uh, I can, you know, balance you know jenga pieces or dominoes or something but i i don't feel like i have any sort of capability to conceptually construct a visual art piece or or an installation piece and simmer free really got behind me on that and was like no let's work on this together uh we have things we can we can bring together in this um and yeah i i think uh the collaboration gives us an opportunity to work outside of our own medium and also learn from one another. And collaboration is an extremely important part of my practice because 
Um, I, I am just tired of being a solo artist from years of, of musical training. It's just more fun to play music with other people. Um, okay, um, unfortunately we are um, running out of time um, and we did book out the, the webinar space. Um, so we won't be able to get to uh, your question, Karen. Um, but I just wanted to end off by thanking um, everyone, artists. I'd say give them a round of applause, but I can't really hear anything. Um, yeah, and thank you so much to um, Amy and the UVF College of Arts, as well as um, the Reach for hosting um, and bring this all together. Yeah, and I'll just uh, again say my website is simmerandbreatheanunt.com, and you can find my email address there if you have any lingering questions. And Connor's email is or website is csvanderbeek.com. Is that right? That's me. Yeah. My first two initials and my last name. If you Google our names, uh, it's like the first result is the websites. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. We'll do an hour and a half talk next time. <laughs> <laughs> I just thank want you, to take a second to say thank you so much, everyone. I'm not sure if you can see in the chat, um, but we have a huge scroll fountain of folks uh, just saying thank you and expressing gratitude for the talk um, on behalf of the University of the Fraser Valley and the Reach Gallery Museum. I just wanna say thank you so much for your, your time and your presence and your willingness to share today. And if you're in the Fraser Valley region, folks, I highly encourage you to go see the show in person. Um, it was really a beautiful, tangible moment to be able to see and witness artwork in person. And thank you so much for joining us today as well. So, thanks everyone. Thank you.